I'm, I'm really pleased to, to introduce um, Enzo Tagliazuki, whose work I, I really, really uh, enjoy reading every time, um, from the University of Buenos Aires uh, in Argentina, uh, where he is the head of the Consciousness, Culture and Complexity Lab. Uh, his work has uh, been concerned with the neural basis of consciousness, uh, really a perfect continuation of our, of our opening lecture today. Uh, over to you, Enzo, and uh, uh, like we said, 15, 20 minutes, I'll start getting a little antsy in the background uh, if it goes much, much longer than that, but uh, we look forward to your presentation, so please go ahead. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, you should be seeing my slides. Is that okay? Excellent. So thanks a lot, uh, Olaf, for your introduction. Also, I'd like to thank the organizers because I know you had to essentially organize the whole conference twice. The first time didn't happen, fortunately, and then, of course, you had to do all over again for this time, so I know it was a lot of work. Um, well, I, I'll start right away because I don't have much time. So, um, Germans are concerned with the weather a lot. They have reasons to be, of course. And if you walk uh, in a reasonably large German city, 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 you will eventually find one of these devices, the Petel Station, which uh, with three numbers, uh, temperature, humidity, and uh, well, uh, uh, the um, pressure, the, they attempt to provide a summary of the weather. So um, in my talk, I will explore the idea that consciousness in a way is like the weather in the sense that in the same way we don't speak about levels of weather and we don't measure the weather in a single number, we perhaps shouldn't do the same for consciousness, or I will try to explore then what are the alternatives of doing so. So first, if of course, if we're going to study consciousness from the scientific perspective, we have to measure it. The, the, I think that the main analogy that has dominated the idea of, of measuring consciousness is an analogy with physics is the idea of temperature. So uh, we see frequent talk about uh, the, the, the level of consciousness, and we see different scales that have been proposed, numerical scales to measure consciousness. We, have, we sometimes even see an explicit analogy when people speak about building a thermometer for consciousness. Of course, different scales can be used for temperature. We have Celsius, Fahrenheit, and so on, but also for consciousness. We have seen in, in Julius to talk recently the proposal of the PCI. We have different metrics related to entropy. We even have commercial systems like the spectral index that, that follow this analogy. And all they have one thing in common in the same way that, that temperature has a reference state. These scales also measure consciousness relative to wavefulness, to conscious wavefulness, which is the reference state. So when you delve a little bit into what neurologists do, you eventually see that perhaps one number is not enough. For example, we all seen this uh, diagram. I think Stephen Loris was one of the first or the first to publish it, in which we have two axes. One is the awareness, the content of consciousness, and the other is vigilance, the, wake, the level of wakefulness. And we it seems to be at least two dimensions are necessary to put different states of consciousness in this diagram. Or perhaps it's even more complicated than that. Perhaps it's not even possible to put the states. Uh, in this uh, y-axis because they are not comparable to each other. So we have a partial ordering. So perhaps we cannot compare the content, the, the intensity of the content of uh, light sleep to REM sleep or to a minimally conscious states. Perhaps these things are different. We cannot compare them. Perhaps if two numbers are not enough even, then we could try three numbers. And we have seen, for example, Hobson's proposal of the I model uh, with three neuromodulators, light, with one uh, neuromodulator, then the external uh, input gating and so on and so forth, which is nicely summarized in this in this book. And, and of course, we eventually run into limitations. And I think that today we 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 are in a position in which we acknowledge that we we need several dimensions to uh, to characterize these different states, as uh, very clearly put forward in, in a, what I believe is a groundbreaking paper by Bain and colleagues in 2016, uh, which basically we acknowledge that we need several dimensions to map, uh, to, 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 to characterize these different states of consciousness. But of course, we don't know what these dimensions are. So we, we end up with these rather plots in which we have kind of a profile for different states of consciousness, but we don't know what the axes are. And this is kind of the big mystery. If, if we go beyond the problem of, of uh, states of consciousness that are in the spectrum of 
what we will call reduced consciousness. It's even more complicated. If we, if we go into psychedelics, for example, or meditation, we have uh, different questionnaires that can be used to assess these different kinds of experiences, and they not, not always give the same results. You can explore this very nice database by Timo Thorsten Smith in, in Berlin, uh, and you will see lots of different states and lots of questionnaires that try to provide an answer to the question, what are the dimensions we need to include to study consciousness? So I'd like to um, very briefly put forward an idea that is that we have problems finding these dimensions because perhaps we shouldn't be trying to find them. And the problem is that we have only in part abandoned the temperature analogy. Even though we still have several dimensions, we, we still hold to an absolute reference state. So perhaps going back to, to physics, perhaps the kind of analogy we need uh, to measure consciousness with physics is that of space. So of course in space, you, 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 you start with the reference point and you have different points in space but if, and then you can change, you can choose a different reference point. So the coordinates in this multidimensional space, in this case it's three dimensions, but you can imagine larger dimensions. The coordinates of course depend on whether you measure the, the location starting from point O on from, from the other, the other or, or origin of coordinates. But there is something that of course doesn't change. There is something that is uh, the same regardless of whether you measure things from this point or this point. And that, of course, is the distance between the points. So in physics, we speak about uh, the distance being an invariant. It does not depend on the origin. It doesn't matter whether you put your origin in any place of this slide, the distance between the points will be the same. Also, if you choose a different set of coordinates, like, for example, you change your basis, you don't use any more uh, orthogonal coordinates, this means that perhaps you choose a different instrument or different questionnaire to assess the, the state of consciousness of the subjects, still the distance will be the same. So no matter the dimensions you choose, the interval will remain the same. So this idea is basically how modern physics is built. It's built about finding invariants and then exploiting them to build physical laws. So I'd like to explore in the rest of the, this talk uh, a few examples of how this works, a few examples of how we can bypass the problem of finding the dimensions if we choose to focus only on the distance. So I will show some examples. I will try to explore how different distances can give different information, build some models that are useful to introduce certain distances. And then I will very briefly uh, touch upon what we expect to do in the future. So um, to, to exemplify these ideas, I will choose three different states that uh, we, we we could call reduced consciousness, even though if, if I am talking about uh, abandoning this idea of unidimensional characterization of consciousness, then, then using the word reduced is kind of self-defeating. So this is between quot quotations, but um, never, nevertheless, we, we, we have the intuition that these are states in which consciousness is less complex or less intense in a way. So we have sleep, starting from early and one intermediate to deep and three sleep, which is a state which is reversible. We can go back from sleep to wakefulness and it's kind of unstable, meaning that uh, not very strong perturbations can bring us back to wakefulness. Then we have anesthesia. We, are, we, we can think of two, two different doses, for example, mild sedation and a stronger dose of propofol anesthesia which induces loss of consciousness. And this is reversible because people go all the time back from anesthesia to wakefulness, but it's more stable. This is the reason why surgeons do not wait for the patients to fall asleep to operate, but instead you use anesthesia. And then we have data from the source of consciousness with brain injured patients, like the minimally conscious state and the more severe unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, which unfortunately can be reversible if this can happen. And they are, of course, more stable. They are also stable. So uh, we can ask the question how similar or different these states of consciousness are in terms of brain activity and whether this relates or not to the, this notion of stability. So uh, to put things in perspective, we can think of a mechanical analogy. We can think of these two landscapes. So these are two, two, two surfaces in, two, in, in a, in a, in a gravi local gravitational field. And we can think of two balls placed. One is placed here and the other is placed here. So if we only think in terms of energy, the energy of these two balls is the same. It's exactly the same. They are 
they are the same level, they are the same height. But of course they are not, we wouldn't say that they, they, their, their state is the same because we know that there are huge differences in terms of stability. One is stable and the other isn't. So this is kind of the analogy I want to exploit uh, eventually. So the brain, you can think as a kind of a ball in a multidimensional landscape. And it makes sense to ask not only questions about the, the energies of the level, but also about the stability. So um, I will introduce very briefly different, different distances that you can use to compare these three states of uh, consciousness. For example, one is what I call the correlation distance. This is compute the mean functional connectivity matrix of each state and you subtract the average baseline. So you normalize by the baseline and then you obtain the correlation of the ETH columns of the resulting matrices between each pair of states. So you kind of, for each region of interest in a template, you correlate the changes in the functional connectivity neighborhood of each region. And then you highlight regions which have a correlation above a certain threshold. And eventually you can also count the number of regions that have this correlation above the, the threshold to obtain a number to compare two states. For example, if you compare N1 versus N2 sleep, you see that relatively large regions of the brain are similar in terms of their correlation neighborhoods. This goes, uh, this, this is less obvious when you compare light sleep to deep sleep, but it goes up again when you compare uh, intermediate N2 versus deep sleep, which is reasonable because these are two states uh, which are both re relatively associated with loss of consciousness. Also, if you compare N2 sleep versus propofol induced loss of consciousness, you see not so many regions, but you see more when you compare deep sleep to loss of consciousness by anesthesia. And then eventually you can also compare and see that both patients have uh, very similar changes, but they are not uh, similar to these other states of reduced consciousness. So we can all in, in, uh, in, include another measure that we, we call the classification distance. This simply training a machine learning model to distinguish one state from its corresponding baseline and then test whether it can all, that train classifier can also distinguish other different states from their baseline. For example, here we have uh, the subtraction, the FC matrix of deep, deep sleep uh, minus the wakefulness FC matrix. And we have the same for loss of consciousness. We can already see they're kind of similar. And then we have the same for the patients which are in the responsive wakefulness syndrome. You, you see that this starts to be more different than these two other matrices. So when we do this, we find that the classifier trying to distinguish between these two can also be applied to distinguish these two and vice versa. So these arrows tell you that there is transfer learning between those uh, two conditions, but not with the patients. The patients are isolated. You cannot train a classifier, at least not in this data to generalize to these other states of consciousness. And then finally, we built a model. This is a very simple model. Uh, and the idea is that the model has optimal parameters that you fit to reproduce the data. And then you can compute the distance based on how similar those parameters of the model are. So the model is, is very simple. This is a kind of model that has been introduced by Gustavo Deco some years ago. It's a model in which you have self, you, you can have either fixed point dynamics uh, ruled by noise or then uh, you can have a transition to a uh, self-sustained oscillation. So you have so oscillations or uh, fixed point noisy dynamics and you couple these using DTI matrices to fit the functional connectivity matrix, the empirical functional connectivity matrix of the different states. And what we do is we, we allow these local regional bifurcation parameters that rule this transition towards the oscillations to, to be heterogeneous in space following priors that are essentially based on the well-known resting state networks. So to sum it up, when we do, when we compare states using these three measures for each, for each distance between all these different states, we have a matrix. We have one matrix for the first correlation distance, for the classification distance, for the model parameter distance. And uh, when the important message here is that when we take all these matrix elements and we put them in scatter plots, they are correlated. So essentially all these matrices with some variation, they are giving uh, correlated results. So they are giving something that you can infer from the other matrices in a way. So they are correlated we see some uh, common results like for example, patients are always separated from the other states, propofol sedation, 
uh, is similar to intermediate sleep stages and deep sleep is similar to uh, loss of consciousness induced by proper food. So um, what we use the model for is we use the model to introduce an idea of a perturbation distance. Basically, we add the periodic force in term at the resonant frequency of each pair of homotopic nodes. So this is a kind of an external stimulation. And then we see if this stimulation changes the goodness of fit of the FC matrix uh, to other states. So basically, if you can displace the matrix from one state to a matrix that no resembles more the matrix we have to obtain for other states. And we use this change in the goodness of fit as a measure of perturbation similarity. So this is the matrix we now obtain with this idea of the perturbation similarity. Basically, this is an easier way to see it. The arrows tells you that you above a certain threshold, you can transition between the source state to the target state using a certain uh, simulated uh, stimulation protocol. And this can be summarized even sim in, in, in even simple terms in this two dimensional diagram. You have the level of consciousness, which is the usual level that uh, we assume we, we, we seen in, in Stephen Slory's Stimulatory diagram before that is, you know, the, the intuition or intuition about what is the level of consciousness, and then we have stability, which is the number of arrows that leave each of the of these uh, small circles. So N one is the less stable state, which is reasonable, and the most stable state is loss of consciousness by propofol, and the patients uh, is very hard to transition them to other states. So sleep uh, goes first in terms of stability, and then we have all the other states as expected, as we hypothesized. We can even uh, look at the brain regions in which the simulation either increases or decreases the level of consciousness. I will not go into this because I don't have much more time, but these regions uh, nicely overlap with frontal uh, frontal parietal, frontal, uh, parietal network, which uh, is usually implicated in consciousness. So um, to almost finish, uh, one, one, one nice thing is that this perturbational metric, when we correlate these, we correlate the entries of this matrix to the other matrices I've shown before the other three, we don't see correlated matrix entries. So we see that the perturbation distance, in, it seems to be independent of the other metrics. So that is why the title of this talk is uh, measuring the level or modeling the level and stability of consciousness because, because it seems to, to me that these are true, uh, at least theoretically, and at least according to our results, independent constructs. So I didn't have much time. I want to finish in a minute, not, not, not longer than that. So uh, some, this is something we're working on, on at the moment. The idea is to uh, find a representation of the data in which you can see, you can visualize all these things, and you can even think of perturbation as trajectories that can be parameterized by the forcing amplitude in some Latin space. So for this, we have been exploring the use of uh, deep learning like uh, of the encoders, for example, to map all these complex uh, FC matrices from different states into a two-dimensional state. Basically, the idea of an autoencoder is to train a deep network to take an input and reproduce in the output layer exactly the same input so that the, di the, the bottleneck encodes uh, ready, uh, a low dimensionality representation of the data. So this is kind of an example of, of the typical, typical use of the color. So if you, if you, if you train out the color to reproduce different faces, then you might find, for example, two dimensions that encode as you change them here, the presence of glasses apparently, and the other seems to be related to the, to the color of the hair of the woman. So we can do the same for, for uh, states of consciousness. And we can actually create kind of this, this space is the analogy of the, 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 the image I showed in, in the last slide. But instead of faces, we have functional connectivity matrix. So we have kind of a multiverse of, of functional connectivity matrices. And here in this multiverse, we map uh, matrices that we obtain from different states, uh, stages of human sleep, going from wakefulness to deep sleep there seems to be almost like a one dimensional manifold, like a, a line in this two dimensional space we find without encoder where we go from consciousness to deep sleep. So the idea we want to explore essentially is what happens when we do perturbations in this Latin space. Can we choose the parameters to make the transitions follow certain trajectories? Are there forbidden zones? 
And, and the nice thing about this, we can visualize the results. So uh, the summary, I'm just going to skip it because this has been very short. So you all, everything is fresh in your mind still. And this is my last slide. These are the people who did most of the shop. Um, so doing, doing science in Argentina is difficult because as you might know, our country is, is broke. So I don't have much to acknowledge in terms of, of, of funding, but I do have to acknowledge the incredible support of our international collaborators, the labs of Gustavo, Stephen, Morton, and Helmut, which uh, the way I see it, they allow us to still uh, do science uh, in spite of all the hardships. And of course, you are also part of the international network. So I'd like to thank you as well. Thank you very much, uh, Enzo. That was a great uh, um, uh, example of, of giving a, a brief and, and thought-provoking uh, presentation. And um, now we come to the main, the main course, as it were, which is our discussion. Um, I am going to, we've never done this virtually, so here's what I'm going to suggest the panel members, if they could sh maybe um, turn on their cameras and uh, they can, of course, uh, chime in at any moment. Uh, anybody in the audience who has a question, uh, you can raise your hand at any time and I will try to get the microphone over to you. Um, we have a couple of questions here. I'm going to... Um, a question. <laughs> sorry, you have, you have one, Randy? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, sorry. I, saw, I, didn't, I have so many windows to look at, I didn't see that. But go ahead, Randy. Uh, we have a couple more in the queue. Go ahead. Okay, great. Excellent talk, Enzo. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I was... As you were building your talk, I was kind of um, so, sort of moving in my mind from sort of a, a, a like a two-dimensional space to characterize these states to this multi-dimensional space that you I think you ended up with. Um, and what I couldn't quite get is um, uh, whether or not like I think the, your last slide was sort of suggesting that these these states don't exist in two dimensions; they're probably existing in multiple dimensions. Just a question of what metrics you're using to characterize these states. Would, would that be an accurate uh, comment in terms of what you were sort of coming to in the last part of your talk? Yeah, so um, yes, so the, the, the first, I think that the, the last slide sends a bit of a contradictory message compared to the previous slides, because what I, what I first want to, to, to establish is the idea that um, you, don't need, you don't even need to, to worry in principle about these dimensions. Uh, if you find reasonably reasonable metrics of, of distances between states, um, this is not new. I mean, this is what represent, you know uh, uh, representation similarity analysis does, or even the kernel trick when you use it, you know, in machine learning. The idea that finding the mappings to certain feature space is not necessary if you can focus on the distances, and actually. And actually, a complicated problem is whether what is a state of consciousness, and what is the granularity required for something to, to qualify a state of consciousness. Is it, for example, uh, deja vu or an orgasm or hitting your toe with a with a piece of furniture qualify a state of consciousness? Well, these are philosophical. These these questions are not settled. And maybe you say, okay, let's abandon the idea of state of consciousness, but at the same time. You know that neurologists find that notion useful, so it's hard to abandon. So um, maybe my point is that if you have a measure of distance between states, you don't need, need to worry about the definition because once you're equipped with a, a measure of distance, you can automatically cluster things and cluster them in a hierarchical way. So you don't have to worry about the dimensions. That's that was the, the first part of, of what I wanted to say. But then, of course, um, it's too abstract if you don't if you don't uh, at least try to find some 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 way to represent your data in a certain certain reduced dimensionality space. So um, yeah, so that's that's why we we are trying to use autoencoders and these unsupervised learning techniques that in principle are nonlinear and they're quite flexible to represent very complex relationships in the data. And the hope is that if if we cannot come up with a theoretical, theoretically convincing set of dimensions to order these states of consciousness, we might as well just put them through these algorithms and try to come up with a 
a data driven characterization and then our hope is okay if we have if we have something useful along that way then to try to to see if, if there is some in that space some reduced manifold manifold dimensionality manifold where these states of consciousness unfold so that's the key idea maybe you don't, you you don't need a huge dimensionality space because when you when you change a certain parameter you are moving along uh, two or three dimensional manifold as you go into deep sleep for example and this this the, the idea that I want to show that that we can try to to find these low these low dimensionality manifolds eventually and try to see how the data relates to them understood Looking over what I see in the chat and in the Q&A box, Victor has his hand raised. Let me say this, and this is directly to what uh, this discussion pertains to. Is it, is it Victor? Can we, can we go to the audience for one question and come back to you after that? Very good. Um, a question here from Thomas Varley. Um, Thomas, if you're out there, um, fair disclosure, Thomas is one of my graduate students. I'm not selecting him because of nepotism, but because his question is has risen to the top in the pile. Thomas, if you're out there, raise your hand and I can give you the mic. Uh, and there you are. Uh, this relates, goes back to the notion of stability versus instability. Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, I just, you know, um, I really like this, this, the framework in general that you're proposing is excellent. This is a great talk. Um, the idea of stability kind of leapt out at me. Um, and whether you could use that sort of to explain um, experiences within a state of consciousness, right? So you talk about stability, you know, it's easy to wake somebody up from sleep, you know, so you're talking about going between states of consciousness. But if you look at a state like the psychedelic state, where you have sort of within state and in very high degree of instability and emotional responsiveness to, you know, small change in the environment. Um, you know, I wonder if the same kind of stability formalism might sort of explain that kind of phenomena as well, or maybe in depression where you see the opposite effect. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yes, of course. I mean, my point is that uh, ideally, I mean, I'm not saying that we manage to do this, but uh, we hope it can be done. You, uh, so, uh, there is no distinction between, you know, the the brief uh, transitory states of consciousness you are describing, like you know, a fleeting thought or or a certain a certain uh, aspect of cognition. Perhaps uh, there's no distinction between that and what we usually call states of consciousness, like you know, dreaming or or uh, anesthesia. Perhaps there is some sort of hierarchical organization. So you have is in a certain uh, landscape kind of wells within wells and you have you know these large attraction ba basins in terms of dynamical systems now where you go uh, which take you to this uh, temporally extended state of consciousness like you know sleeping or a psychedelic state and then within those you have even smaller basins of basins of, of attraction which take you to other you know states of consciousness that that you identified for example as these transitory uh, feelings and so on, but there's no, in principle, no, uh, no huge difference in terms of, of neurobiology between them. Of course, we know there is because uh, to have a psychedelic state, you basically take a psychedelic drug, and this induces changes because of the drug itself. Um, this is different from, you know, mind wandering, which is everything is kind of spontaneous. Uh, but uh, again, I, I, eventually, this framework would. would would flourish if if we abandon this idea of, of longer states being quite qualitatively different from these shorter states and we embrace the idea that that everything is in equal footing and, and we can treat them uh, equally that being said of course uh, yes um, this has been done i mean explored not done but the idea that uh, psychedelic states induce a state which is more metastable meaning that that is easier to to transition between one metastable state to another, and this, of course, has implications for entropy and so on. This has been explored, and of course, it could be done uh, within this, also within this framework. But this, just to finish, the psychedelic state itself is not what I will consider uh, as a state, uh, an unstable state, because you know that it takes a certain number of hours to, to for the trip to end, and until that happens, well. You are stuck uh, in for 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 better words in that state. So, uh, but within that large basin of attraction, the the, the 
it could happen that that the the, low, the, the metal stable states that that live well there uh, change more rapidly one into the other, and that of course could be explored. And, and I believe actually that this is something like that is happening in the psychedelic state. I'm going to, I was going to go to Victor, but I will go to Susan first because I had overlooked her question in the chat. Victor, right after that, sorry about that, my friend. Uh, hang, hang in there for one minute. Uh, Susan, you had a question related to, to stability as well. Uh, yeah. Maybe that might be, maybe now is a good time to come to come into it. Okay, thanks, Olaf. Yes, in many ways, I think my question does kind of follow up on Thomas's and actually what Enzo was getting to at the end of his answer to that question. So Enzo, I noticed that you had these three options, right? Of reversible, unstable, reversible, stable, irreversible, stable. Was there a reason that there's that it can't be irreversible and unstable? I mean, if you think about the fact that you may not, if you think of irreversibility as not being able to return to the prior stable state, perhaps there's also a case where you're not able to land in a new stable state either. And so then you're in this multi-dimensional space, you might actually be wandering around in there without finding a, a new stable state in which to form. And could this underlie something like, like the schizophrenic state or some of these psychedelic states that we're talking about? Well, people in the 60s believed that, well, some of them do anyway today, but they believe that if you took psychedelics, you could become schizophrenic. No, we know this doesn't happen, but that's what, what was uh, something that was uh, widely believed by then. And this, this could fit uh, your model sort of, you know, uh, so you, you take a drug and then you never go back to, it's kind of a nightmare, nightmare scenario, but you never go back to the original state, which of course you never do, right? I mean, uh, that's why <laughs> that's why you took the drug in principle, but uh, you, my point is that you don't end up being schizophrenic, that doesn't happen. But um, it could happen, of course, we know, we, yeah, I mean, we could think of, of, of all different possibilities, like, you know, there are drugs that are not psychedelics that could, uh, after taking them, you might not go back to a healthy, conscious wakefulness state. So yes, I mean that could happen. I mean, it was not. It was a nice question. It's not among the examples I, I looked into. But uh, yeah, it's, it's it's something that sounds like you wouldn't want that to happen to you because now it's it's a, uh, it's an uh, going going to to a different state is usually well. It might be a good, uh, in quotation marks, good or desirable state. But then uh, the, the, the reversibility part is what worries me, you know, that you cannot go back to normal. Uh, so yeah, that's possible. That's a nice, nice suggestion. Victor, finally, I'm, I'm uh, sorry about the delay. Go ahead. Please do, do not worry. We have 300 attendees here. <laughs> <laughs> really, please do not worry. Uh, and so. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was a pleasure to listen to you and to Julia. In fact, both of you turned towards uh, principles, foundational principles uh, on a phenomenological level, trying to understand consciousness. And I really appreciate this. Yeah, And uh, uh, you have made a reference to invariance yeah so when i say foundational principles i meant you really also made a reference to physics and some of the principled levels of argumentation we use uh, in physics and uh, you you spoke about dimensionality i'm really not worried about dimensionality uh, uh, you can have a one-dimensional manifold that spans an n-dimensional high-dimensional space depending on how you fold it yeah so that's not an issue but the invariance part uh, intrigued me. Invariance is uh, intrinsically linked to symmetry. Yeah, to symmetries, symmetries that we have to impose upon the system. Very often, both are equivalent. You either go. Mm. This, I think I lost. Uh, for translational symmetry space. Victor, you have a. Am I lost? Can, can you back up can you back up one or two sentences and 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 and, re, and restart that turn of thought please you, you were frozen okay I, i'm sorry i'm sorry uh, so uh you hear me now right yep. 
so I, I'll try to be short. As, um, how seriously do you want to take this in uh, variance and symmetry? Can you hear me, Olaf? Yep, at the moment, yes. Okay, yeah. And so how seriously do you want to take this? Uh, uh, principle and apply it? Is it purple or do you really want to uh, work it and apply it? Well, one property, for instance, is symmetry and invariance. They to uh, of certain states, but they do not make a statement about the stability of these states. Yeah. So when you these aspects, the stability is provided by other determinants. A particular, uh, for instance, you have a, a beautiful example with a uh, gravitation where you had uh, a stable and unstable state, but you had m times g pointing downwards, yeah, the, which determined the stability of the particular state. Um, uh, so uh, there you had a symmetry breaking that uh, from the outer environment that was actually linked to the stability. It was not existence of the state itself. Do you have this systematically? Do you have any thoughts on this, on the appearance? And there are links to the uh, stability. And Susan also talked about stability versus ir irreversibility. Stability in this sense uh, would be just a very, very uh, stable system such that you cannot go into other states. But that's a different story. Uh, I would like to have your thoughts on the notion of how far do you want to push this invariance idea and apply it to the domain on which you're working on consciousness? Right. Yeah, so um, not very far at the moment. So of course, as, as you said, it's uh, complicated to, to, I mean, to, to take it uh, as seriously as physicists do uh, because of, well, because of all these, these complications. Uh, I, I'm not expecting to write a Lagrangian based on this invariance anytime soon, of course. Maybe somebody will, I'm not into that. Um, but, but on the other hand, I think that there are lessons to be understood from, from this idea of invariance that, are, that, that will be helpful short term, especially for um, those who are uh, looking into the characterization of uh, states of consciousness that are uh, well, that are not uh, like, you know, anesthesia or, or, or sleep that are richer in content. For example, psychedelics, that's one example. So the way we, um, we usually measure the, the subjective effects of the, those drugs is with questionnaires. And the kind of questions you have is, for example, between one and 10, how intense was your experience of ego dissolution? So you read that question and you ask yourself, I mean, what, what, does it, what does zero mean? Is it like my usual ego dissolution that I experience every day? What is, I mean, what is the zero? What is the reference state? So um, it's implicit that we try to use these questionnaires compared to uh, conscious wakefulness all the time. That, you know, these different uh, states should be first measured against wakefulness to then be compared between themselves. And I think this is problematic for, for this, that reason precisely, because some of the effects of these drugs are so different to what you usually experience when you are uh, during conscious wakefulness that you, would, you wouldn't be able to, 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 re, to reason, to, to compare, you know, uh, to, to put a number that compares the, that experience with conscious wakefulness because they are re really different. So my point is that that, that doesn't really go into, into the physics part. I mean, it could be, it could be extended in the analogy in that direction, but mostly it's, it's a methodological observation that if we might as well just stop uh, using uh, conscious wakefulness as a reference state and simply focusing on the direct similarity between or differences between these states. For example, some work we are doing in the lab for, for quite a long time is, take, is taking... Um, subjective reports written as natural language, you know, the, the, the kind of reports that, that Aldous Huxley wrote, for example, in his famous book, uh, 
the doors of perception, but written by other people, go in not only, of course, psychedelics, but other different states, and they report them, and then we use natural language analysis tools to compare them directly and to introduce a matrix of similarity or distance between each pair of consciousness that doesn't go through wavefulness. So we end up not uh, with a with a with with a set of dimensions, but we end up with a web, with a graph, in which these connections are weighted, and uh, they they there is no origin, there is no center. We have comparison between all pairs of states directly, and I believe this is much more helpful than trying to fit uh, a hierarchy of states all compared to conscious wavefulness, as which we, which might be not a very easy comparison to do and then using that uh, to compare between those states uh, going through wavefulness. I think that's problematic. So to answer basically your question, uh, it's more of a met methodological point and it, it doesn't really, I, I don't expect this analogy to, 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 stretch, to be stretched to the point of, you know, talking about uh, symmetries or, 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 well, or, or all the, the, the you know, or how the physicists make this invariance work. That could be possibly work for the future, but I'm not aiming on that yet. Thank you for that exchange. Very interesting. Um, I have two more, I see two more questions from the audience. Andrea Lupi, if you are out there, um, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll then go to Hussein Ava after that. Uh, Andrea, I see you, so you should be able to ask your question. Go ahead. Hi, um, thank you so much for, for this very enlightening talk, Dr. Taliuzuki. Um, I was just wondering if you have thoughts on the state of sleep inertia, which is when people awaken from sleep, but then sleep seems to linger on in terms of neural, but also in terms of cognition. What, what do you think would be the correct characterization of this in terms of the framework that you have been um, exposing to us? That's thank you. Question. Yeah, so um, that's a very good question because uh, the way I put everything it said, uh, I, I kind of uh, led you to believe that there are kind of boundaries that can be drawn, you know, very neatly between these states. And this, of course, is an illusion, right? So uh, you have transitions between states. This is very problematic because those transitions are by themselves or not uh, states of consciousness in the proper right. So um, this is usually what happens when we try to, to force uh, rigid clustering of states of, or, or anything basically into, into boxes. So uh, the, there are boundaries. The boundaries can be more or less diffuse. As you mentioned, the sleep inertia could be one of those boundaries. And, and, and that's problematic. I mean, that's my, my answer to your question is, I don't know. I mean, uh, I rather just try to understand, uh, you know, the, if you can imagine like a high dimensional state a space where all these different states of consciousness live in, and you have these boundaries. Well, I'm, I find the, that terrain much more difficult to think that perhaps the centroids of the clusters, which are more or less, you know, you move a little bit in 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 in, in any direction, and you're still within the same uh, state. So uh, the problem of transitions is completely, which I believe, kind of the sleep inertia is sort of an extended transition. So. That problem is completely beyond the scope of what I thought, thought. and I think it's a it's a terrain for new ideas that might not necessarily be the ones I presented. So it's an excellent question, and because of that, I think uh, it's it's uh, it opens the way for future research that it's, I don't have at the moment answers to to it. Thank you for that question and and the answer and. Uh... Hussein Ava in the audience, if you are uh, listening uh, and would like to ask your question, could you please raise your hand? Uh, there you are. Uh, uh, go ahead, Hussein. Yeah, you should be able to. I'm going to talk. Um, I don't. Hi, I'm um, there. Okay. Yep. Thank, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you. I don't have much to elaborate upon other than. Um, just uh, the general nature or um, some speculation or conjecture of the final of the final part of the project, speaking about encoding and decoding on consciousness itself and how much that research and work in that area could actually be um, applied into actual machine consciousness or artificial consciousness. Is that a sort of, is that the direction that that sort of research would be heading 
heading in or would it be irrelevant to that area? Well, it might or might not be relevant. Sorry, yeah. Okay, so it, it might or might not be relevant. I don't know because it's not something we're going to explore. I mean, um, I'm, I mean, we, so we, we are just thinking of this as physicists and as trying to fit uh, into the framework of, of the mostly dynamical systems, but perhaps other other areas of physics, these ideas. Um, for me as a physicist, whether a machine can be or cannot be conscious, uh, well, I have, I, have a, I have my opinion about that, but I don't have any, any uh, perhaps Julio's talk was much more informative, you know, in terms of the theory. I don't really have a theory behind my opinions, so, so they are useless. Uh, so the brief answer is it might or might not be useful, but in our hands, for sure it won't be useful because we are not really trying to move in, in that direction. I see another hand in the audience. I'm going to go with it. And uh, this is from Akshay Ravindran. I'm going to unmute you, Akshay, and uh, go ahead and uh, ask your question if you can hear Hello, me. Thanks, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Um, so in regards to the last variation auto encoder uh, part, um, was there any regularization, regularization done for the latent space? Because um, the model would I actually either learn uh, very small variants or like very different means, uh, just like a regular auto encoder, right? Was some auto uh, regularization done uh, to ensure continuity? Yes, yes. This is this uh, is the variational auto encoder approach. So uh, this, ha this has in the cost function uh, a regularis regularization built in that ensures. Uh, Continuity in latent space. That is, uh, we not only encode, but we can also uh, change, move into, in move into the latent space and decode meaningful functional connectivity matrices because of this, uh, this regularization. I mean, I, 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 I think it has to do with the um, uh, the LK uh, distance between uh, width of the of the. Of the distribution in Latin space between that and and a Gaussian functions of of zero um, of of zero mean and one star deviation. Basically, you you put a term like that in the in the cost function to ensure that there won't be gaps in Latin space uh, where you if you find yourself there you won't produce a meaningful output. So yeah, that's the ba yeah, that's basically uh, because it's a variation on generative variation on the color. Generative is the key word. For your question, yeah. Thank you for that question and answer. A last question from the chair. Um, how's that? Uh, I, I, ha I have something that popped into my head uh, as I was listening to you, Enzo, and you talked about functional connectivity. And it relates also to an important point that Julio made, which is that uh, when looking for certain manifestations in, in, in brain data, the level of grain and the granularity may really matter. And of course, you know, we all know this fMRI, uh, we are not seeing neurons, far from it. We're not even seeing real neural populations in some way. We have a complex signal to deal with that's, you know, spatially and temporally filtered and, 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 and whatnot. Um, is it safe to assume that uh, important uh, neural correlates of consciousness will express themselves in this particular empirical construct that we work with a lot or perhaps it's something yeah. else or maybe nothing at all. Is, is it the right way to look at the brain? It's functional connectivity. You we were talking about this at the end of your talk in the context of your recent work. Is that the right modality to use or should we use something else? Right. Uh, well, I think that when we speak of these uh, states of consciousness, uh, when we compare, for example, anesthesia to wakefulness, uh, it does. I mean, I think that, that uh, if, we, if you look more precisely on the content, or cognition, or, or even you know the content of consciousness, uh, you 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 surely will require the decoding of, of what neurons are doing at a much finer scale. Uh, otherwise, we we know that that's the scale in which these contents are represented in the brain. But um, as a physicist, I I, I I do something that that perhaps is wrong, but it's a first approach. That is, I think we can decouple these. Uh, 
fine scale representation from the, the routing of information between regions. So, and that is the, the routing of information between regions, I think that is, that really has to do with the global state of consciousness. Um, so it's actually the, the dynamics and, and you can think in terms of the dynamics because it's, it relates to that, it relates to integration, it relates to, to, uh, to coupling between regions, it relates to, to long range and atomical connections. And then what happens, you know, the actual contents this framework uh, is is insufficient for that because you really need to look into the fine scale. It's a little bit like you know uh, thinking of how people move uh, when they are moving in in a city. Then you know if you only look at the, the highways, you that's not enough to to understand how they're moving. But when they are you know they 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 decide to go from one city to the other, then you can look at the traffic, the you know, long long range train la train lines and highways. That is informative of what is globally happening in terms of traffic, but you lose track of the people the moment they start walking through the streets. So this is similar. I think that the global for the global state of consciousness, this could be enough, but uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't stretch it into the direction of modeling contents because uh, fMRI. Well, fMRI is probably enough for some of them. I mean, we know you can you know map uh, you can decode contents of consciousness from fMRI for sure. But not at the regions of the, the, the size of the regions of interest we're including in the model, and, and perhaps in the future we could do that, but uh, not with this kind of you know large scale models that, that we are using. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Thank you so much, Enzo, for a, a brilliant talk and uh, and, uh, and a lively discussion. Following uh, uh, this is not easy to do, and 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 I think we had a good start into this segment of the workshop. Thanks to you. So thank you very much, Enzo. Thank you.